We all know that Sir Alex Ferguson is one of the greatest managers of all time, who made some truly fabulous signings. Peter Schmeichel, Patrice Sevra, Park Ji Sung, and those are just some of the ones whose names begin with a P. In fact, right at the start of this year, I made a video all about just that subject, counting down what I felt were Sir Alex's best ever signings, so if you'd like a look at some of the Wiley Old Scots best transfer business, feel free to go and give that video a watch at the end of this one, but today is the turn of some of Sir Alex's worst duds. When you spend almost four decades in football management, including 27 years at arguably the biggest club in the world, you are not going to have a 100% record within the transfer market. Even if you only ever signed brilliant players, which Sir Alex certainly didn't, that is no guarantee of success since it takes much more than talent to make it at a club, particularly at a club the size of Manchester United, and even more so, particularly at a club the size of Manchester United while standards were being set sky high by Sir Alex Ferguson. The last point I'll make, which is a rather pertinent one, just before I begin my countdown, is a reminder that this is not the seven worst players that Alex Ferguson ever signed. The likes of Manucho and William Prunier might top that kind of seven, but neither cost the Red Devils a great deal, in either fee or wages, and neither played enough to do real damage. Diego Forlan, by contrast, was a fantastic footballer, but he struggled in England, he cost the club a fair old amount, and he was sold for a significant loss. So, he was a worse signing, despite being a much better player, just to give a couple of working examples. Without further ado then, who did train at Manchester United under Fergie but never actually signed for them, here is who and how I would rank Alex Ferguson's seven worst signings of all time. Ralph Milne The story of Ralph Milne is a rather tragic one, and he is the earliest of Fergie signings at Manchester United to make this seven. Though he was signed for just £170,000, an amount of money that the average Manchester United player earns in a week these days, Milne was signed way back in 1988, during only Sir Alex's third summer at the club. £170,000 still wasn't a fortune back in the late 80s for a club of Manchester United stature, but it was rather more than £170,000 now, and it made Milne the club's seventh most expensive signing on Ferguson's watch. Brought in from Bristol City, where Milne had enjoyed a brief renaissance following a failed stint at Charlton Athletic, his signing was always a gamble. Sir Alex knew the midfielder from his time at Dundee United, where Milne had broken through very young and had made an immediate impression. As his time in Dundee went on though, Milne began having ever-increasing disputes with manager Jim McLean, who once called him potentially the most exciting player in Scotland, but now accused him of lacking discipline. Milne was an alcoholic both during and after his career, as well as struggling with a gambling addiction. Fergie often felt that he could rehabilitate players, famously having once come close to signing Paul Gascoigne, and he offered Milner lifeline at Old Trafford in November 1988. Unfortunately, Milne struggled for game time following the emergence of Lee Sharp, and after suffering a groin injury, which required surgery in 1990, Milne fell further into alcoholism, from which he would never recover. He retired at the age of 32, and in 2009, Ferguson described the Scot as having been his worst signing, claiming that he still got condemned for it. Milne tragically continued to drink heavily after hanging up his boots, and in 2015, he died due to complications relating to liver problems, aged only 54. Zoran Tosic Zoran Tosic was actually unveiled as part of a double deal by Manchester United, which saw both him and his partisan Belgrade comrade, Adam Lajic, both arrive at Old Trafford. Though the duo were announced as a double signing, Tosic arrived immediately at the club in the summer of 2009, meanwhile Lajic was set to arrive the following January. That was said to be because the Red Devils thought Lajic would benefit from more first-team football in Belgrade, whilst Tosic was already capable of competing for a starting berth. But in the end, United reneged on their deal to sign Lajic, who went on to join Fiorentina instead. I can remember there being a lot of excitement about both players at the time, since Manchester United's last Serbian recruit, Nemanja Vidic, had proved to be such an outstanding bargain, and both youngsters were very highly rated. In truth, Tosic too could have benefited from a bit more time in Belgrade, as he freely admits himself, describing the training sessions at Carrington as having been, quote, like another sport, due to the physical and technical levels of his new teammates. Tosic and Lajic combined were reported as costing Manchester United £17 million, subject to add-ons, 
but of course, Lajic never arrived, and Tosic is widely reported as having set the club back a little over £6 million. Not an astronomical sum by any means, but still their second most expensive arrival of that summer. Tosic made just five appearances in 18 months at Old Trafford, and later expressed regret at having forced his way out of the club due to a lack of first-team opportunities. He joined CSK Moscow in 2010, where he spent seven years, before rejoining Partizan and the 34-year-old now plays for FC Tobol in the Kazakhstan Premier League. Yekshimesh. Massimo Taibi. Fresh off the back of winning a historic treble, Manchester United welcomed two recruits from the Italian game over the summer of 1999, namely Mikel Silvester and Massimo Taibi. Sylvester was an immediate hit, having turned down Liverpool to sign for the Red Devils, before putting in a masterful display against the Merseyside club at left-back on his Manchester United debut. He went on to make more than 350 appearances across nine seasons at Old Trafford, winning 10 trophies in the process. Taibi, meanwhile, only ever made four appearances for the Red Devils, and would go down as one of the club's worst players of all time. Taibi was always in a difficult position, tasked with replacing Peter Schmeichel at Old Trafford, perhaps the greatest goalkeeper that the Premier League has ever seen. At £4.5 million though, Taibi was, at the time, the most expensive goalkeeper in the history of the English game, setting expectations for the former AC Milan shot stopper pretty high. On his debut, Taibi came miles out of his goal, but came nowhere near to claiming a Jamie Redknapp cross, handing Liverpool their first goal of the game before picking himself back up again and claiming the Man of the Match award with a stellar performance. In his post-match press conference, Fergie likened Taibi's debut against Liverpool to Peter Schmeichel's debut against Leeds United, marked by an early mistake, but a swift recovery. He would be less charitable when, in his third game for the club, Taibi dropped one of the most infamous clangers that the Premier League has ever seen in a 3 0 draw with Southampton. The Italian was nicknamed the Blind Venetian by the ever-charitable English press following that blunder, for which he blamed his studs for being too short. In his final game for the club, and in what was the final straw for Sir Alex, Taibi conceded five goals against Chelsea as Manchester United recorded their first league defeat in 10 months. He returned to Italy after just six months at Old Trafford on loan before being sold to Regina for £2.5 million. Bebe. Bebe has always appeared to me to be one of the game's good guys, at least from the outside looking in, and it's great to see him having settled down over the last few years at a wildly passionate community club who have really embraced him. The story of Bebe's move to Manchester United, and of Bebe more broadly, has been exaggerated, distorted, and mythologised to such an extent that it can be difficult to sort the fact from the fiction. If you believed everything that had been said about him, you would be led to believe that Bebe was barely a professional footballer, he was signed off the back of a single YouTube clip, and that Sir Alex had been convinced that he was going to be the next Cristiano Ronaldo. There are some unusual quirks to Bebe's arrival at Old Trafford, such as the fact that he had only been at Vittoria for six weeks, and he had only played in pre-season games for the club when Manchester United signed him and they did lead to genuine questions about the wisdom of the club's scouting and recruitment methods, but some of what has been said is just patently absurd. Bebe was abandoned by his parents as a child and raised at an orphanage 20 kilometers outside of Lisbon, an orphanage that he reportedly returns to every year with presents for the children residing there now. Following his meteoric rise, Bebe struggled to adjust to the levels required at Manchester United. Alex Ferguson long maintained that it was only ever a question of Bebe's fitness levels rather than his technical ability, but his repeated miss-hit crosses and poor decision-making across his seven games for the club suggested that his manager might just have been looking to protect him. Bebe was not cut out to play for Manchester United, but that doesn't mean that he was a total no-hoper, as some have implied. Signed for £7.4 million and sold for £2.7 million, Bebe now plays for Rayo Vallecano, age 31, who are above Barcelona in the La Liga table at the time of this recording. Eric Jemba Jemba In the first segment of this seven, I mentioned the fact that Alex Ferguson called Ralph Milne his worst signing back in 2009, but he, like I often do, still found time to add in an honourable mention. Or a dishonourable mention, in this case I suppose. That most likely, rather unwelcome shout-out went to Eric Jemba Jemba, 
whose name is rather cruelly synonymous with the idea of not being very good at football. I was pretty young when Jemba Jemba arrived in the Premier League, and I just remember his name being used almost as a byword for someone doing something rubbish when I played football at that age. As with Bebe, the idea that Jemba Jemba was some kind of hopeless amateur is obviously greatly exaggerated. He won 34 caps for Cameroon, and he joined Manchester United after winning the African Cup of Nations as one of his country's star men, and after catching Ferguson's own eye in a Champions League tie against the Red Devils whilst playing for Nantes. Ferguson described Jemba Jemba as, quote, looking like a Manchester United player in every sense, end quote, upon his arrival, and he praised his aggression, athleticism, and passing ability. There was even talk of him being club captain Roy Keane's long-term successor. Jemba Jemba certainly exhibited his aggression on his debut against Arsenal, leaving his studs in during a challenge on Sol Campbell, but not much else. Signed for £3.5 million, Jemba Jemba, so bad that they named him twice, made a total of 39 appearances for the club in all competitions, over a period of 18 months, before joining Aston Villa for £1.5 million. He failed to pull up any trees at Villa Park either, eventually settling at a dense in Denmark, and he retired only earlier this year, aged 40, following a brief stint in the fifth tier of Swiss football. Cleberson A man who was unveiled at Manchester United on the same day as Cristiano Ronaldo, during the same summer as Eric Jemba Jemba in fact, whilst Ronaldo went on to win the Ballon d'Or at Old Trafford, and a further four Ballon d'Ors at Real Madrid, stamping himself down as one of the greatest footballers of all time, Cleberson, well, Cleberson didn't do any of that. But then again, Cleberson has won the biggest trophy of all in world football, and Ronaldo hasn't. So, you win some, and you lose some. It was after that World Cup success in 2002, in which Cleberson performed brilliantly alongside Gilberto Silva, that a flurry of European clubs began to take an interest in him. Cleberson came close to agreeing a deal with Leeds United, but the midfielder didn't want to leave Brazil without his fiancée, who he was unable to marry until she turned 16. Cleberson was 23 at the time, and started dating Diane de Silva when she was 14, which is a bit yikes, but 14 is Brazil's age of consent. Happily married, European clubs reignited their interest in Cleberson in 2003 and it was Manchester United who got their man for a fee of £6.5 million. However, a combination of injuries, difficulties adjusting to the English game, and the incredible talent that he had for competition in his position, Cleberson was only able to make 30 appearances for the Red Devils, few of them being particularly impressive. In spite of the fact that he was a World Cup winner, Cleberson still admitted that the level at the club was far too high for him at least in his position, describing the battle for a starting berth with the likes of Paul Scholes and Roy Keane as being, quote, not a fair fight. Cleberson was sold after two seasons for around £2.5 million to Besiktas. He went on to win 32 caps for Brazil, the last of them coming in 2010, and he hung up his boots in 2016 following a short spell with the Fort Lauderdale Strikers. Notably, the Fort Lauderdale Strikers also retired, or were dissolved, rather, in 2016. Juan Sebastian Verón By far the most gifted player in this seven, and it is not even remotely close, when I reiterated my selection criteria during the introduction, I did so largely with Juan Sebastian Verón in mind. In his last decade as Manchester United manager, following Roman Abramovich's takeover at Chelsea and the late arrival of Sheikh Mansour at Manchester City, Sir Alex had to be very calculated in the transfer market and try to outmaneuver their bigger spending rivals through smarter recruitment decisions. But at the start of the 2000s, the Red Devils were the Premier League's biggest spenders, and they really drummed that point home over the summer of 2001. Ruud van Nistelrooy arrived for a fee of £19 million, but it was the arrival of Juan Sebastian Verón for a British record £28.1 million that really set tongues wagging in England. Verón was a magician with the ball at his feet, who had lit up Serie A the previous season, alongside compatriot Hernan Crespo, working under the soon-to-be England manager Sven-Goran Eriksson at Lazio. Upon his arrival, Ferguson described Veron as a world-class player, adding that, every time we have bought this type of player, he has done wonders for us. The first half was certainly true, but Veron would prove unable to do wonders for Manchester United. The pace of the English game was often cited as being the biggest problem for Veron 
who loved to pick his head up and dictate the tempo of a game, though the real dilemma for him, as far as I'm concerned, was more likely the existence of Paul Scholes and the difficulties that Alex Ferguson had in attempting to accommodate them both. Veron made 82 appearances in just two scenes at Old Trafford, but whilst his form in the Champions League during his second season was impressive, his impact in the Premier League was never really befitting of the division's record signing. Veron departed to Chelsea in 2003 for around half what United had paid for him, which was still enough to make the Argentine the most expensive footballer on the planet in terms of cumulative transfer fees at the time. Capped 73 times by Argentina, Veron later settled back at home with Estudiantes, where he retired in 2014, and once again in 2017 after a brief comeback, and where he now serves as the club's chairman. Veron was a brilliant footballer, but given the size of the fee that Manchester United paid for him, his difficulties establishing himself, and the fact that they finished third during his debut campaign, and ultimately his sell-on value, I think he was probably Sir Alex's worst piece of business overall. That is my seven, but honourable mentions, or once again, I suppose, dishonourable mentions, go to the likes of David Bellion, Diego Forlan, Jim Layton, Liam Miller, William Prunier, Gabriel Obertan, and Anderson. Anderson is a particularly tricky one, since he did actually enjoy two very good and very successful seasons at Old Trafford, which ensured that he didn't make my seven. But he also had some pretty poor ones, and he did cost the club a small fortune. I'm sure you'll all have your own ideas and suggestions though, and alterations to my seven. So feel free to leave them down below in the comments. Thank you all very much as ever for watching. Hit the like button if you enjoyed this video, make sure that you are subscribed and have notifications turned on for HITC7s. And you can also find me on social media, on Twitter and on Instagram via the username at HITC7s on both, should you wish to do so.